Question one. In this question, we are interested in the scores obtained in a test. Let S represent those scores. We are told that S is distributed normally with a mean of 102 and a standard deviation of 19. We want to determine the proportion of scores that are over 113. Entering the statistics mode, we can use the normal cumulative distribution or NCD to calculate our desired probability. So 0 0.281 or about 28% of the scores are over 113. Thus, the answer is option A. Question two. The first thing that comes to mind for this question is that the instantaneous rate of change of temperature can be found by differentiating the temperature function. We could consider graphing the derivative of the temperature function. However, if we consider the possible answers we can see that the answers range between 7 and 10, so it will be more efficient to use the table mode. Inputting the instantaneous rate of change, we are now going to set up our table so that we only see the values of x from 7 to 10 in steps of 1. We are looking for the first integer value of x for which the instantaneous rate of change is greater than 100 degrees per minute. This is clearly when x is equal to 10. And so the answer is option A. Question three. Let P equal the proportion of people who identified price as the most important factor when deciding where to shop. In a random sample of 1,200 people, 40% claimed that price was the most important. So our sample proportion, p hat, is 0 0.4. We want an approximate 95% confidence interval for the proportion of people who identified price as the most important factor. The formula for a 95% confidence interval for proportion is given by Thus, by evaluating this in the run mode we will use P to represent P hat and n the sample size. This gives us the upper bound of our confidence interval If we modify the expression above, so it becomes a subtraction, we get the lower bound. We find that the 95% confidence interval for the proportion of people who identified price 
as the most important factor is 0.372 to 0.428. This is option D. Alternatively, we could use the confidence interval option in the statistics app. We go under interval, Z, and we have one proportion, so we click that option. We need to note here that X is equal to the number of people who identified price as the most important factor, not the proportion. So, X is equal to 480. Question four. The function Y equals 0 0.5 to the X is positive for all values of X and its graph can be seen on the screen. The integral of 0 0.5 to the x from 0 to 3 calculates the area between the x-axis and the graph from x equals 0 to x equals 3. This can be approximated using the trapezoidal rule as follows. This can now be evaluated in the run mode. So the answer is C, 1.31. Question 5. This question can be solved efficiently by hand. Thus, we can see that option D is the correct answer. Alternatively, you could solve this by using the Solver app. I like to set the variable we are looking for equal to zero, just as a habit. Or we could graph f of x equal to log base three of x take one and g of x equal to two and find their intersection point. All these approaches are perfectly valid, but the best method will be the one that balances minimising time and the production of a correct answer, which may be different for each person. Question six. Let Y be the number of seeds that germinate when eight seeds are planted. Y is distributed binomially with N, the number of trials, equal to eight, and P, the probability of success, equal to 0 0.8. We want to calculate the probability that at least six seeds germinate, at least six. So we could have six, seven, or eight seeds germinate. So we desire Y to be greater than or equal to six. To calculate the probability that y is greater than or equal to 6, 
we will use the BCD mode in the Statistics app. So, the probability that six seeds germinate is 0 0.797. Answer A. Question 7. Given that we are told f dash of x, we know that we need to integrate it to get f of x. We could do this by hand, plus c and all that, but given we only have four options to choose from, we might be able to take some shortcuts. Firstly, we know that the integral of 1 over x is ln x. So, f of x must include ln x. Options c and d don't involve an ln x term, so they are clearly incorrect answers. If we now look at option a and b, they both have a 2x cubed term, which makes sense to be the result from integrating 6x squared. If we integrate 1 over x squared, we get 1 over x. So option B appears to be the correct answer. Huh, we got to this answer without using the given fact that f of 1 is equal to 5. We should check our answer is consistent with f of 1 is equal to 5 by substituting 1 into option B and see if it is equal to 5. So therefore, B is the correct answer. Question 8. We are given the displacement S of t of a particle and want to determine its instantaneous velocity at t equal to pi over 2. Instantaneous velocity is the derivative of displacement, evaluated at an instant in time, in this case at t equals pi over 2 seconds. So we need to evaluate s dash of pi over 2. Before evaluating this on our graphics calculator, we must first check our graphics calculator is in radians. My calculator is currently set to degrees, so I am going to change it to radians. The instantaneous velocity of the particle at pi over 2 seconds is 3 meters squared. Option D. Question 9. To find the intersection of the graphs f of x and g of x, we will make use of the graph mode. Enter f of x into y1 and g of x into y2. Given the question did not specify any domain, we will use the initial view window and see if we get lucky and can view both graphs. Well, I can see one lovely red graph representing g of x, but no f of x. Let's zoom out using the subtraction button. Ah, there it is, there's f of x. We can reposition the view window to get an even better view. Using G-Solve and F5, we can determine the intersection of the two graphs. So, the correct answer is D.
Not that it matters for this question, since we found the correct option, but do you think this is the only intersection point between f of x and g of x? I think it's worth pondering about this, just in case you come across a question where it does matter. We have learnt about the properties of f of x, and we know this graph increases slowly and then takes off like a rocket and increases much, much more rapidly. This type of curve never turns around and starts decreasing. It is an increasing function. If we look at g of x, you may be thinking, I don't know what this looks like outside the view window. But what if we rewrote this function using negative indices? Okay, we get 3 e to the negative x. Well, how about now? This is just the reflection of e to the x in the y-axis. So we can pretty confidently say this function will always be decreasing. Beyond this one intersection point shown here, f of x and g of x will always be travelling away from each other. And so a second intersection point is simply not possible in this case. Question 10. Ah, some good old mental differentiation to finish this section of the exam. We are given the velocity function of an object, let's say this cute puppy, travelling in a straight line and want to determine an expression for its acceleration as a function of time. The acceleration of the object, also known as the puppy, at time t can be found by finding the first derivative of v of t. And so the correct answer is option A.